history with the Freeborn County Historical Museum Library and Village. Um, this is like, whoop, whoop, we're back. Hello. <laughs> we took a three month sabbatical. Uh -huh. I looked, I went and looked. Um, it doesn't feel like that long, mm -hmm. but when I think back of all the things that we've had going on and what we've done, every once in a while it gets a little crazy here. And some of these things like cocktail history mm -hmm. just kind of drop to the background. Right, not the priority at the time. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, welcome back. Um, today we are talking about the martini. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may or may not know, um, a classic martini usually is gin mm -hmm. and vermouth, garnished with either an olive or a lemon. But we're gonna do a vodka martini. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge gin fan. Oh. It's oh, well, yeah, me too. It depends and, on the gin. And, and I almost brought gin to be, you know, oh. traditional. But um, I had the flashback to the juniper bushes we yeah. planted where we both reacted. Yeah, and, we got little dots and our high our arms. Yeah, and on our high schooler who planted them totally had a... Yeah. So, anyway, we didn't go the juniper route. Right. So, vodka martini it is. Yeah. Um, and a vodka martini... This is a quote from uh, an article I was reading, but it's this is a true statement. Is a drink truly made to taste? So if you're gonna order a vodka martini, you need to know what you like and how to do it. Oh. Um, is it shaken or stirred? Right. Do you want it dry or wet? You want olive or twist? Uh, you like it dirty? I mean, there's all... You gotta know what each of those means. Yes. I order a vodka martini dry, straight up olive, preferably a blue cheese olive with mine. Shaken? Shaken, not stirred, not stirred. Um, but interestingly enough, I did find, uh, so I'll, I'll go back, I'll get to that later. Bruised gin, it was oh, just a oh, weird, you know, man. Yeah. Um, so the martini is also considered an American cocktail. Most of what we have done have not really been American cocktails. They've kind of made their way sure. over, uh, which makes sense because some of them will go back as far as the 1700s. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, this has a cloudy past. Oh, of course. Because while it's considered an American drink, um, there are some people who put its origins in Europe. Okay. Um, back as far as uh, France in 1758. Um, a German musician, John Paul Aegis Schwartgendorf, Schwart, Schwartgendorf, uh -huh. um, changed his name to Jean Paul uh, Martini. Did he want to sound French? He wanted or? to sound like a Italian, Italian. composer. Jean Paul sounds Jean French Paul to sounds me. French to me also, yeah. but I'm not. You know, uh, and his favorite drink was a mixture of gin and white wine which became known among French musicians as Martini's um, name. Um, and some of these musicians may have immigrated to the United States, bringing the drink called the Martini with them. May okay. have. Okay. Mm. I don't know. Um, California is where most of the stories come from. And I think we talked about this when we did um, the Epiphany. Mm. Um, so I'm gonna skip one of those theories, but Professor Jerry Thomas was a famous and influential 19th century bartender, professor in quotes. Uh, he invented a drink at the Occidental Hotel in San Francisco in the late 1850s, early 1860s. Um, and the story goes, this is about the miner Martinez. Um, who, uh, the miner went out on a, he oh, headed yeah. to Martinez, California, put a gold nugget on the bar and asked, you have something, what was it? Mix him up something special. And so Thomas produced Old Tom Gin, which is sweetened gin, um, vermouth, which was a sweetened vermouth, bitters, and a maraschino. And they dubbed it the Martinez. Some people think that the martini came out of that. That's right. They removed the Z. Um, the uh, difference though, the fact that it was sweet, I I don't buy the Martinez thing. Oh. It, it's a, eh. who knows? You can always come up with a story around a cocktail. 
Mm -hmm. Probably because Definitely. people drink the cocktail and then start telling the story. Yep. Um, so before we tell our story, should we mix the cocktail? Yes. Because we're losing our frosting. We are. We did chill our glasses. Um, so you want to put some ice in here. And we have washed Hand our wash. hands. Um, and I think we should do these separate. I think we should okay. mix one and mix one. Okay. Um, and then you're going to add two and a half ounces of vodka. Oh, that one's a good boost. My favorite is the Grey Goose. I know. Um, I get a headache from vodka. Oh, well, maybe we're going to share one. I don't know. No, there's plenty. Um, I get a headache from some vodkas. One of the things that I thought was interesting, they were talking about the popularity of the martini and other drinks, heavier drinks kind of waned in the 70s oh. and made a comeback um, and in the 80s and 90s. And with the martini, absolute vodka is credited with bringing the martini back uh, because they did a, <laughs> the guy said a brilliant advertising campaign around the martini. So until then, it was kind of a dead, um, a dead um, drink. drink. So then you're going to add a half an ounce of dry vermouth. I haven't used this one as much. No, that one's mine from home. Oh, okay. And you don't, I don't use, I'm going to mix these two different ways. So this is the traditional oh, way. Oh, you said a half? Half an ounce. Right. And we're going to shake that. Okay. Um, and I learned something today. So when you shake it, it gets cloudy. It gets a little ice in it and you know, kind of uh -huh. shaking it up. Um, and I like it because it's really cold. Oh. I keep my Grey Goose in the freezer and I like it shaken. And uh, that drops it down to yeah. like zero degree Fahrenheit. Like, oh. Uh, now it's you, breaking apart and everything. Yeah, and if you stir it, it stays clear and takes on the look of a, ge of a gem. That's yeah, yeah. So pour that in one of those, and then we're gonna dump our ice out. Oh yeah, cloudy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's gonna show up, but I think it shows up a little bit. So then we're gonna dump our ice out, and I'll show you my trick because I like mine. I like mine dry. Okay. So. Is that wet? That one is wet. Okay. That's what we do with absinthe. No, we, we don't. don't. We do vermouth. You're never supposed to throw absinthe though. I know. But the the rinse was the rinse. And then um, add the ice. Okay. And then just two and a half ounces of the vodka. Oh, so you don't even put the vermouth in after no. the rinse. Okay, no. two and a half and then two and a half of that. Um, and I'm gonna top you off with an olive. Do three. Three olives? Uh-huh. Why three? I'll tell ya. Oh, okay. Oops, I splashed. And then I'll do two in mine. Oh, <gasps> you're not supposed to do two. Why? Well, you'll have to tell me. I always do two olives. <gasps> oh, no. Always. And if you wanna make it dirty, you just add a little olive juice to your to your martini before you oh, shake sure. it or stir it. Um, I I'm not a fan of a dirty martini, but I know a lot of people who prefer a dirty martini. Dinner and a show, folks. <laughs> That one's not as cloudy. That's interesting. Yeah. So does the vermouth make it a little cloudier? Maybe a little bit. Okay. You just have one of them out. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm afraid you're like throw it at me. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. What was that all about? Mm. There's a whole superstition related to olives with oh. your martini. Interesting. So what is the superstition? So, 
I gotta grab my paper here for it. So, olives were not with, I just have to stop you for a minute. I'm gonna give you kudos because I didn't even think to look up olives. Oh, that was with smart. that? Well, they were never formally used in a martini recipe until the 1930s. Okay. And that was when they had the olive brine in there. It was a perfect a la Highland is what it was called at that point. And they did a half a teaspoon of olive brine. And FDR, when he repealed prohibition, that was his drink of choice. It was a martini with olives. And um, olives and martinis have gone hand in hand ever since. Okay. Uh, but um, it's, well, why an olive? Because it's an aesthetic. People like the look yeah. of it with the drink. But it also is a As long nice. as you use a proper olive. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it also du doubles as like a salty treat with it. Oh, sure. Like for the taste, yeah. it's really good. And um, so when a martini is served with three olives, seasoned drinkers might enjoy one with the first sip. Yeah, okay. And then consume the rest when you finish the drink. So that explains why many restaurants serve them with three. Mm -hmm. Now I usually have a few sips and then eat an olive mm -hmm. and then a few more and then an olive. I can never eat the third olive. Really? It's just... It's too much for me. Okay. Um, there, so with this simple garnish, the olive is subject to one rule. The olives topping martinis must always be in groups of three or singular. Interesting. An unspoken superstition deems an even number of olives to be bad luck. <laughs> so it's like avoiding a black That cat. explains so much <laughs> in my life. <laughs> oh no. I've been doing it wrong for years. <laughs> uh, most seasoned bartenders will only serve martinis with one or three olives, never two or four. Oh, I'm going to start calling out some bartenders. Yeah. It's, um... So there's a, a quote that's high tradition dictates that you must use an odd number of olives. One olive is fine, so are three. Five is excessive. Uh, using two or four olives is a faux pas. And that was from Brad Gadbury. Interesting, well I have a faux pas, folks. Um, and it might come from an Italian superstition that considers that anything served in even numbers is bad hostility or hospitality or bad luck. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Oh. Um, so you did mention FDR. I did. And politics. Oh, a little bit. I'd yeah. asked her earlier if she did anything on politics. It's an FDR. Uh, and I kind of choked a little bit when we were doing our intro. I realized I printed on both sides of the paper. Oh, no. I she never do that. Me. So anyway, um, the martini is considered one of our most political drinks. Because politicians drink it or yes okay. it was the first drink of the day for Gerald Ford when he was a member of the house it was Richard Nixon's last drink before he stepped down as president um, in the Hay Adams Hotel it was served to John McCain oh. and barman John Boswell once told New York Times John McCain doesn't want a razzle dazzle martini he wants like a straight-up one mm. or what yeah. Yeah. Okay. He wanted a he wanted the traditional gin martini. Um, during the Mad Men era, the martini became symbolic of tax write-ups for wealthy businessmen, and JFK started the war against the three martini lunch. Huh. Uh, and and George McGovern in '72 said there is something fundamentally wrong with the tax system when it allows a corporate executive to deduct his $20 martini lunch while a working man cannot deduct the price of his bologna sandwich. They could write off Yeah, it was drink. a business drink, three martini lunch. In 76, Jimmy Carter was famously railing against the working class subsidizing the $50 martini lunch. Carter failed to push through the three martini legislation but Reagan pulled it off in 1986, reducing the meals and entertainment write-off in exchange for lowering the business tax. Clinton later finished the job with deductions on um, changing the deductions. And by the time he was done, the three martini lunch had made as much business sense as businessmen after three martinis. <laughs> oh my God. And then of course, 
President Franklin Roosevelt loved martinis and hosted a daily martini hour, although um, history tells us he was a terrible mixer and oh. used some rather interesting ingredients um, like fruit juice. In the martini? In the martini. I don't think that would taste good. So the political thing, I just thought that was interesting and I hadn't realized that, that politicians took on the three martini lunch. Huh. I had an uncle who did three martini lunches. So wow. That's how I knew about the three martini lunch. Yikes. Huh. My mind is blown that you could write off alcohol on your taxes. Oh, sure. If you, if you entertain, uh, and businessmen can still write off some of that. Huh. You have to show, um, I shouldn't say businessmen, business people can still write off. Um, not as much. They tighten them up even more, I believe, uh, either Bush or Obama. Okay. Weird. Yeah. Huh. What other stories you got over there? So with that olive, you know, it was like the superstition. Mm -hmm. So I, I pulled up a superstition thing um, that I didn't know about because it happened 10 years before I was born. Um, oh, know, so many years ago. <laughs> um, do you know anything about Halley's Comet? A little bit. I mean, I remember learning about Halley's Comet. Okay. Halley's Comet. Halley's, Halley's, Halley's Comet. Okay. Um, it, it came through in 1986, mm -hmm. and it will come through again in 2061. So, like, there's a possibility of seeing it, like, in one lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, but in uh, 1986, there was a lady by the name of Bernice Breckbill or Brechbill, not sure. Uh, and she was living with her family in Freeborn, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And she was 10 years old. And her parents encouraged her to go out and watch the comet go through the sky. And um, she said it was just like a piece of mist filled with little stars moving across the heavens. Uh, and she said it was wonderful. And uh, the gal that was interviewing her asked if anyone was frightened. Because mm. it was a whole, you know, cosmic event that tends to kind of stir up. Yeah, a but it bit was 1986. Like, yeah. Um, but there, she said people weren't frightened, but there were, well, her family wasn't frightened, but there were several people around them that were. Um, and she said she knows somebody who even sold their farm in Freeborn because they thought they wouldn't need it. Interesting. Because they wouldn't be living much longer. I, I think there were conspiracy theories yeah. about it. That's kind of what I recall. And, and, and my brain is foggy in 86 because I was a new mom. Sure. Um, and it also happened uh, during the time that my mom was dying. Oh. So I had fog brain. Yeah. And so I, I remember some some around sure. that. But it wasn't a big deal in your life well, at the time. No, like we, I didn't go out to watch it, I know. Sure, because it was uh, several nights in the summer that mm -hmm. people could go out and see it. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lovely image. It was probably very pretty. Oh yeah. Can't yeah. wait for it in 2061. <laughs> How many years is that from now? About a little bit less than 40. Yeah, I'm not gonna catch that one. <laughs> well, not with that attitude. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure I'm not gonna catch that one. <laughs> Not sure I want to catch that one. Catch no. that one. Uh, do you want me to go to the next story? Sure. Okay. Because I just have some silly facts and maybe oh. I can tie into your story. Okay. So um, I got one because the vodka martini is also called the kangaroo cocktail. I knew you were going to go that route, so yeah. I stayed clear of the kangaroo okay. cocktail. Okay. Well, I don't really know for sure why it was labeled that. All I know is that kangaroos are in Australia. And um, we do have an Australian tie to like Freeborn County. We um, do. Yeah. Harvey R. Neist or Neist uh, was stationed in Australia in 1942 in World War II. And have we talked about him before? I feel like I we have. Know. I don't know if we have. Oh, maybe when we were doing the exhibit. It could be. Yeah. That could be. Um, but Australia. Is it a place I normally hear of when I think about World War II? Right. I mean, you think of South Pacific and stuff, but that tends to be a little bit more north than Australia right. when we're talking about it. Um, so there was a Battle of Brisbane that happened in 1942 in Australia. So when our guy was over there, I don't know how involved he was, what was going on with him during that time, 
But this happened, and it was a riot between the United States military and the Australian servicemen and civilians. Yeah, it was like an internal kind of conflict that happened. Um, it was an area that had personnel, personnel waiting for deployment, or um, they were resting, convalescing, refitting from previous combat operations. Um, or manning the allied military bases. So okay. it was kind of, it was less of really active duty and more of kind of an in-between. Sure. Um, but the population of Brisbane, because of all of the like US servicemen coming in, increased uh, by about 80,000 people. Oh, yeah. And so they were having a hard time kind of coping with the amount of people that they needed to support in that right. area. Um, with the resources and so like a lot of tensions started to build sure um, because US forces received better rations um, and the shops oh. and hotels gave preferential treatment to Americans oh um, partially because it was a time when um, like the United States in their like movies and fashions you know people were really interested in that and so they were kind of um, really interested in the Americans and kind of their culture and yeah, what sex they were doing. Appeal. Yep. Not so that, much well, any, not so much anymore. <laughs> but that was actually a big point too because they were taking the Australian women. Um, uh, because they had better rations, so they had better things to offer. They had more money. They had um, they were given things that were actually banned in Australia. So they were given things that they could then <sighs> give, you know, off. Um, also, the United States military uniforms were seen as more appealing, so they had more style. Uh, now, I will say, the military uniforms for the United States are, um, they have really good lines. Yeah. They have yeah. a very good line. They fit them. nice. They yes. Fit. Yes. Um, Men's and women's. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Um, uh, there was, the Americans had the custom of caressing girls in public. Oh. According to Australians like their eyes, did not. that was not oh. the practice at the time, is oh. what they were saying. So the American troops had silk stockings and candy that they would give out to the girls. Um, Has <laughs> anyone ever given you silk stockings? <laughs> no, me either. <laughs> it was the forties, though. <laughs> um, so that went about to make about 12,000 Australian women married American soldiers. Oh, wow. That's a lot of, of women. War. Yeah. Um, there was also the idea that uh, Americans viewed the Australians as being less capable in war. And, uh, which is kind of mind-boggling to me because growing up, Australians were always viewed as they're really hardy and like they can survive so much like the animals in australia yeah except Ooh. i think you know that to us is exotic and us to australia is exotic right sure. i mean i the we have grizzly bears oh, that's true. and 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 have you ever seen the moose up close and personal no but or a large. buffalo i mean yeah. so we've got it i think it's the same okay <laughs> um but uh, even though Australia was bearing the brunt of the land war in New Guinea, like mostly by itself, uh, there was uh, a commander, MacArthur was his last name, who would report back to the United States and say that it was American victories. Oh, Or he sure. would say it was American and allied victories. Okay. So he like, wouldn't credit the Australian sure. soldiers. Uh, but Australians also kind of looked down upon American fighting abilities and saying, um, that most considered the Americans an inferior fighting force who seemed all glitz and brashness. So it was like more talk and not any action was kind of their view. All mouth. Yeah. Um, and there was, um, I don't feel like I'm qualified enough to talk on this point, but there was an issue of um, like views on race too. Sure. There were several African Americans stationed there and also Aboriginal Australians who were stationed there too. Um, and from what I can tell, the Aboriginal Australians received like equal pay and benefits, while African Americans did not. Um, so there was like that tension sure. there. Um, but again, I'm not really qualified yeah. to talk much on that. That would that. be interesting to look into further. Mm -hmm. um, 
But according to authorities prior to the, the battle, um, up to 20 brawls happened a night between oh, Australian and Americans. Um, and then a big, huge battle occurred and there was one Australian death, oh, dear. several other injuries. Um, but after that, it settled down and um, an American said that they could go into a pub and an Aussie, as he said, would come up and slap him on the back and say, oh, wasn't that a good ruckus the other night? <laughs> And then so they I would have a beer. They just needed to work they it out. And to... Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but it was. It ended up being a time where American influence was really large in Australia. So they started to sell like Coca-Cola products and coffee, hamburgers, hot dog stands, and um, cinema from oh. America kind of went and influenced them too. Um, but American soldiers in the lower ranks earned twice the amount of their Australian counterparts in higher ranks. So that was oh. part of the attention too. Um, and got and had better rations right? and yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was where our guy was stationed. That was Harvey R. Nice or Neist. I bet we time. talked about him when we did the map downstairs to put the pins on. Yeah, and probably. Is he the only one we found, I think, that in was Australia. from Australia? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. That's certain in Australia. I think you're right. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. So I have a, um, I have an Ernest Hemingway tie-in. Ooh, okay. I know you like Ernest. Yeah. Ernest Hemingway's favorite martini was the Montgomery, named after World War II British Field Marshal, who thought his odds on the battlefield to be fifteen to one, and that's the way Hemingway liked his martinis: fifteen parts gin and one part vermouth. Oh my. Um, oh, W.C. Fields, who was a comedian and an actor, um, okay. also enjoyed martinis. He started his day with two double martinis, one before and one after breakfast. He also carried an oversized cocktail shaker full of martinis for the day's shoot. He drank about two quarts of gin a day. Now, I wasn't quite sure if W.C. Fields was playing a drunkard. <laughs> <laughs> or if he was, but apparently he was. <laughs> that confirms it. He was a drunkard. Oh, no. Comedian George Burns once said, I never go jogging. It makes me spill my martini. <laughs> That's a reason <laughs> to opt out. And and so this was an interesting little, little tidbit, too, that um, I, two of these popped up, and they're almost identical. Um for a Julia Child dry martini, just hold the vermouth bottle and bow in the direction of France. Uh, the Churchill martini uses no vermouth at all and should be prepared with gin straight from the freezer while glancing at a closed bottle of dry vermouth or with a sly bow in the direction of France. <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't because, know why. I, I, is it because that's where he wanted to be viewed as from the guy Jean Paul? Or I, I don't. Maybe I don't know. So maybe they both knew something we didn't know about the, the creation yeah. of. I feel like Julia Child usually knows her stuff. Sure. <laughs> Churchill seemed to be on top of things. Uh -huh. Well, okay. You mentioned like actors and um, comedians. You, you know the, the TV show, I Dream of Jeannie? Oh my God, yes. The, I, what is that? Oh. It's the like... Wouldn't you, I happened? wish I could do that. I'm in Hawaii. Oh, I was like... <laughs> I'm in Bali. Well, there was, uh, she made a vodka martini on the show. Oh gosh, I'm sure I've seen that episode. She made it gush from a rock in the desert um, for <laughs> Captain Nelson. And, and Major Healy was along. Yeah, and he called it his favorite potion, even though he really wanted water, but yep, yep. she made that come out, and um, that made me think of a Freeburg County connection with Eddie Cochran, because he has a song called Genie, Genie, Genie. Oh, okay. Yeah, from 1958, and um, it didn't hit very high in the charts in the U.S., it was 94th, and then posthumously so a year after his death it was released in the UK and it rose to 31 over there so they liked it there almost all of his songs in the UK do better yes do mm -hmm, much better mm -hmm. um, Stray Cats is, did a version oh, I love the Stray Cats they've done several covers of yes. Eddie um, yeah, we just had Eddie Cochran 
uh, car show and music festival. And we had some really good music. We had oh. fabulous cars that turned up for the car show. Um, and we had Dave James, who was here three yes. years ago from the UK, mm -hmm. who came back. He played with our band, mm -hmm. and he is the number epitome one. number one Eddie Cochran yes. fan. And that was really fun yeah. to have that connection. Um, the Martini is also very popular with James Bond. Yes. And Goldfinger, Sean um, Connery. It started out in the first Bond novel, Casino oh, really? Royale. That's really where it that? was first. It should. Doctor No was the first film it appeared in, and then it just continued from there. But it was first in the first, very first Bond novel. Uh, three measures of Gordon gin, one measure of Russian or Polish vodka, and half a measure of Lilith aperitif wine. Lilith is one that. Yeah, on, on some of our drinks, they said you could swap, you could do uh, with sweet, vermouth. sweet vermouth instead of the Lilit. Um, and the variation was properly called a Vesper after his love interest in the book, book Vesper Lind, who perishes. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you said, because he said, like, shake it, not stirred. Yep. In Goldfinger. Yes. And so I found um, in our 1882 history book of Freeborn County, there are some um, lovely gold glasses that are mentioned. Ooh. Um, and it was a Jacob LeBrand or Librand. He was short of stature. So I love how people are described in, the, in this book. So he was short of stature with a with thin features and a Roman nose. He was unusually neat of appearance and wore gold-rimmed eyeglasses, keeping his clothes immaculate, although living in a community where carelessness of dress was the rule. Without being a fop, he always had the appearance of being freshly laundered and tailored, keeping clean shaved and wearing expensive broadcloth. He had uncommonly pleasant manners was beloved by all and made an especially good impression upon people who were contemplating taking up their homes in this county. But he also was, uh, being a Unitarian, was consequently looked upon by early settlers as not being of sound theological prowess. Oh dear. Because he was a Unitarian. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the glasses. I thought you were talking Ooh. martini glasses. Oh, I'm like no, waiting for it, but I realize you're talking his yeah. spectacles. Yes. His eyeglasses. Yes. Huh. Funny. Um, immaculate. Yes. I wish he we was still dressed so well. I wish we would still write that yeah. way. I feel like I need to practice writing mm -hmm. that way. Good words. Mm -hmm. Um so finish off a couple here. Yes. Dirty martini contains a splash of olive juice, I told you. Oh, yep. A wet martini contains more vermouth. A 50-50 martini is equal parts gin and vermouth. Upside down or reverse martini has more vermouth than gin. Okay, okay. So, so it's a different if, part. It's a different, if you're gonna order, yes. Mm -hmm. Those are all terms, okay. which goes back yours to- yours was a dry. Dry. Mine was a wet because of the vermouth. Yes. Okay. And um, dry on, you can do dry on the rocks oh. or you can do dry straight up. So there's a lot of rules to follow. Yeah. Um, so good luck when you go and order one out. Great.